I swear, like, <laughs> I, he wanted like he was him, like he shaking was. with rage, and like it felt like his wig was gonna fall off. <laughs> main subject today is of course about Simon D. Oh, here is your host, Simon D. Basically, to me, Simon D is like beyond fiction in that his like tale is like almost too extreme and too cliched to be like a believable in any film. Like, he was massive in 1969, and in 1974 he was driving a bus. Well, he was crap, wasn't he? And the first like proper, proper casualty of TV. He went from earning a great deal of money to absolutely nothing. Yes, well, everything just disappeared. Like I was aware of him, but like having done research, I didn't realise how big he was and how influential he was. That as a high flyer in the media, I would have my line tapped by British intelligence. I mean, they would want to know who I was talking with and what I was talking about. I mean, it's, it's, it's logical. There was a couple of documentaries, wasn't there? Do you remember them? Mm. About him? Yeah, like, watch some of the weirdest documentaries for 2003 um, uh, by, what is it, Victor Smith? Victor Lewis Smith, yeah, yeah. Victor Lewis Smith. The oddest, some of the oddest documentaries um, based on, like, sense. kind of self-aware on documentaries. Um, there was a night of Simon D, and I don't yeah. think Channel 4 would uh, now <laughs> devote, like, a whole night to someone who <laughs> who did not really been heard of for 30 years. Yeah. But it was, it was his life story. Yeah. And then there was, like, three programmes. There was... Him then presenting his old programme 30 years later with, like, not particularly famous guests. And then there was a really odd discussion <laughs> where he sat around. And I'm sure, like, at one point they were smoking cigars. It genuinely wouldn't surprise me if Steve Coogan chose him as a kind of, at least took inspiration. Basically, he did what Alan Partridge did. But it was the 1960s, and it feels like the joke of Alan Partridge was that Alan Partridge was basically 30 years behind <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. with that cheesiness. Which, as I say, I feel like the 60s was pre-cheese because a lot of the classic Simon D pose was like the uh, classic Alan Partridge pose. Yeah. And yet there were... But, there were, but you know what's interesting? Like the Alan Partridge character has his own TV show and falls from grace, and he ends up living in a hotel yeah. and presenting Radio Norwich at 5 a.m. in the morning. This is it. But the Simon... De that is like an exaggerated for comedic effect for the real-life story of Simon D. You'd think she spent all night in a refrigerator next to the milk. <laughs> And he was right. Ladies and gentlemen, the top of the milk, Susanna York. His first professional gig is with Radio Caroline, isn't it? England's first commercial radio station. My name's Simon D. with you for the next two hours. First one off the top of the pile, the Hollies, Rock and Robin. Simon was, I, I think I'm right in saying, the first voice on Pirate Radio. And I met him on board, and I found him a terribly nice guy, you know, and um, very tall, good looking guy. Because uh, I remember on Radio Caroline, one of the things I read was, well, I saw a picture of him being presented an award by the Beatles. Yes. Like, for, on behalf of Radio Caroline or for, like, best show. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like, that is... Like, that, you don't normally think of the Beatles in terms of, like, their appearances of presenting awards. That's what a little <laughs> yeah. known. <laughs> what an honour that must have been for the Beatles to present Simon D with an award. I mean, in, I feel like Simon D would probably have said that unironically. <laughs> like, was, well done, guys, you've, you've done well now. You've done it. You've nailed it. He, he ended up leaving Radio Caroline in 1965 uh, to go freelance. But what he'd done before, and is he'd fallen out with the directors because he basically... He basically refused to play certain records, um, and 
on other occasions he, he would just like disobey orders so he kind of left or so he was pushed out because of um because of his ego yeah, which is interesting, yeah, because he, he just like, you know, weirdly though, his career took off due to his arrogance, and then it ended. This is why yeah. he's such a perfect Greek tragedy. And there's nobody here, that's all taped applause. Nobody here. <laughs> See, that's all taped. Put a little button there. See? I can cue little small laughs. Listen. <laughs> See? Obviously, he gets big with the chat show, doesn't he? Why are you so fat? Because I eat too much. <laughs> I think he just hit the zeitgeist because what's he was kind of referred to as like very like compared to like the Chris Evans and I feel like that's so fair because like with the Big Breakfast and then TFI Fridays that was like Chris Evans like um, oh. perfectly placed himself within Britpop right and yeah. And, That's like, right. everything about Chris That's Evans true. was perfect for, like, that kind of, like, arrogance of Britpop. And I think it was the same of Sam D in the swinging 60s. He had all these, like, big stars. Like, he had, like, Sammy Davis Jr. On his on one of his shows, he had the Jimi Hendrix experience. Robin Morley was a massive actor at the time. He had uh, George Lazenby. He was going to be James Bond. George Lazenby had smoked a lot of weed. Mm. And it was the last... Was it the last, I think it was the last ever show he presented. It was kicked off afterwards, show. yeah. And George Lazenby, basically Sam and D, like, encouraged George Lazenby to talk about <laughs> his, like, thick, like, arguably crazy conspiracy theories <laughs> and the assassination of <laughs> Robert Kennedy. The president going back and to his left. I kind of feel that that is the equivalent of just like letting Daniel Craig on be like, oh god, yeah, Bill um, Bill Gates is microchip is all now, and he's like, yeah, yeah definitely, <laughs> definitely, it's a great photo. Yeah, he's, you know? he's, he's, uh, he's Roger Moore. Uh, I don't believe 9/11 ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just a hologram. <laughs> yeah, and he's just like <laughs> on autopilot. Yeah, totally, absolutely. <laughs> I've I've heard that myself. Yeah. Like, it got to the point, which is amazing when you think of how his life could have been if this had happened. He auditioned, or he was t meant to audition to be James Bond in 1969. Like, that. that's... He literally could have been, like, he kind of immortal. He said, oh, then they, they didn't want me because, I, like, I was too tall. But then they were like, well... <laughs> Oh, right, oh is it right, number one, Sean Connery was six foot two and he was not taller than Sean Connery. And secondly, like what 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 director's gonna say no? Like what women like are much shorter men. So let's 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 get D out there. <laughs> yeah, let's get it. Short dark. Realistically, answer, Jay, you know. many things could be said about James Bob, but yeah, they're not. They're, yeah. they're not going to be be discriminating against someone for being too tall. He had a cameo in the Italian job. Do us a favour, Adrian. Yeah. Shorten the sleeves, will you, love? I'm not a gorilla. It's just very homophobic because he played he played a gay butler. Like I mean, you can imagine the um, the amount of subtlety that he put that, that he, <laughs> he would have put into playing a gay man in 1960, considering the type of. Like level of cheesiness. Is there going to be sort of like um, what is it like a refined portrayal of? of yeah, uh, I don't. I, I don't think he stuff. spent ages researching like um, homosexuality and trying to get a perfectly nuanced performance mm. um, <laughs> to show what it was like to be a gay man in the late sixties. I haven't even. I seen don't really it. think that. I don't think there was no method gone into it. I do believe. Hey, I haven't even seen his cameo, and I now know exactly. How how he will have played that part with absolutely zero Yeah, but, but like he claimed in the interview he was really good at it, but he, like he wasn't. I thought he was one of the most powerful people on television, actually. I mean, he had a tremendous following. The adults liked him, the kids liked him, everybody liked him. I'm going to ease everybody into the tale of Bill Clinton, right, yeah. by saying <laughs> that <laughs> like this is the least significant fact in the story, but I some in some ways it's the most interesting, right? No, it's but right. Bill Cotton's 
Um, Bill Cotton is is he the brother of no he's the cousin of Fern Cotton's granddad. Yeah, that's right. They're they they are related. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> like you don't <coughs> see him on like on like the kind of documentaries in the time and like you know like the peak in mm. the seventies. Yeah, he, he was like one of the big producers behind Morkham and Wise. Oh yeah, he's like he, mm. his name. He was massive. This is it though. He was bigger than Simon D, but not mm. necessarily. Not definitely not in fa- terms of fame. Mm. But he was like the establishment for TV. He was like the establishment, and this is why it's fascinating because he destroyed Simon D. He knew how to act, though he were a star. <laughs> Mark you, he knew how to act though, though he were a star even when he wasn't one. What happened was he ha- it was him who plucked D from relative obscurity yeah. and he made like Simon D to be fair, he got he did he had his was given his own show, but then he kinda went to another level once the viewing figures went to eighteen million and went to another level. I thought, my God. Here we are in deepest Wales, and this is the effect of, of our show. How extraordinary. Bill Cotton had massive success as a producer yeah. off the back of Sam and D's success. And then the second, not the second, but when Sam and D got too much, like, he destroyed him. But just listen. Just do what other people tell you just for once in your life. And that would anger him enormously because his ego had grown at all proportion. Bill Cotton wasn't happy with the salary demands. <coughs> and then what? Mm. And so he said, he was so D was getting 250 quid a show, all right, and when he was broadcasting twice a week from Manchester. And up until 1967, basically, it equated to about, I don't know, about £4,000 like per show today. Can you imagine that? <coughs> And I was saying he was doing it twice a week, which got him like eight grand a week, pretty much. And then what happened was they, the BBC continues to pay £250 a show. So what they did was the BBC said, all right, then, well, what we'll do is, yeah, well, you know, £250 a show. But what they did was they guaranteed him that. But then they just took away one of the shows. So actually, they kind of halved his salary. Bollocks. Complete rubbish. First of all, if you have a show, it's your show. He went to Bill Cotton and said, right, I to be offering me this. You've been offered a thousand pounds a show by London Weekend Television. And uh, would I like to make a counter offer? Which, so I said, yes, 200 pounds a show. And uh, his agent said to me, no, hold on a minute. You're paying him 250 now. I mean, you're offering 200. I said, yes, I just want to be sure he wants to stay. When he went to ITV, um, David Frost realised that actually the show that Frost had was very similar to the Simon D show, very similar in format and style. And David Frost kind of, it was almost like he bought Simon D just so he could bury him. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, got, this is it. He got used by like the the establishment, and to be fair, David Frost was almost another level to Bill Cotton because yeah. because he was also he had the it was like Bill Cotton and Simon D combined. But now this is like the most yeah. unbelievable but beautiful beautiful in terms of drama moment when <laughs> Simon D like was struggling with payments on his house because he'd gone from being one of the best paid people in telly to driving yeah. a bus. Yeah. And he went to court and it was a magistrate's court. One of the judges, he was found yeah. guilty and put into prison because one of the judges was Bill Cotton. <laughs> it's amazing. That's like... Like, I can't believe there's not been a film of that, other than that it's almost too far-fetched, but it was <laughs> Bill Cotton sent him down. The madness is, though, that it was basically to punish him for not accepting the 20% pay cut. <laughs> it is like for Simon D to have had a career, like, <laughs> continue to have had to work out and be subservient to, like, the mad dictatorship of, like, this Bill Cotton figure of, like... You accept this offer now or I'm going to destroy you. He, he walked down the court and when he got to the door, he turned around and he went, bye, Bill. And uh, my two um, co-magistrates 
and said, what a dreadful person. And I could only say, um, not really. I said, at one time, he, he paid my wages. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, That's interesting. <laughs> that, that is cold, isn't it? Because the big thing about his show, they're being introduced going, it's Simony. When he was walking to his prison cell every day, all the prisoners would go, it's Simon yes. D. It's in a weird way, he's kind of, I mean, like just horrible taunting, I guess. Just remembering a guy who literally five years before was like the, the most thing. successful person imaginable. But like, but a prison chant's good, probably not the worst. I mean, yeah, there's worse thing than being chanted in uh, in in prison. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so I mean, I mean, being shivved is is surely. I mean, probably worse. They gave him another chance to get back into radio, and on the first day. Uh, there was a feature in the program that he was about to do a coffee break item and I gather they'd booked Gary Glitter uh, to come down and he was going to be the guest of Simon D and this was before all the problems with Gary Glitter I mean this was years previously to that and uh, I gather Simon said well I don't really want to interview Gary Glitter they said well he, he's on his way down we'd really like you to and he said no I won't and he just walked out there's, there's a couple of interviews with him in the 80s and he looks like if you think there's like about it's about an eight-year period, and he goes from this, like, cool, urbane, you know, quite chill guy into being, like, a real, like an, you know, like, about, like, a 60-year-old a uptight It's like, man. you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of what Star Wars did with Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? Because, okay, right. like... I don't know where this is going, but... <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, one. you know, like, the original Star Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yeah. Is played by Guinness. Alec Guinness. Is it? Guinness, yeah, yeah. Alec Guinness, right? In like the prequels that came out in the nineties, the same character was played twenty year. Well, it's meant to have been twenty years early. Was played by Ewan McGregor. Yeah. Right. So theoretically, when that character in twenty years went from looking like Ewan McGregor, like in his <laughs> like in his kind of showbiz prime. Like <laughs> to look in like Alec Guinness slightly pre death, right? That it was the Simon D transformation. Six years of fame and thirty three years of nothing. <laughs> and then there was a show that uh, Lewis Smith did right after that documentary played that was like, oh, like this, like it's D time again. And it was huh? almost like it to me. It seemed quite clearly that it was almost like a pilot. Deconstruction. Victor Lewis Smith, from what I know of him, that would have been like his dream. Clearly, he had a vision, and that was well. Imagine if I can get D time back again. My perspective, he thought, you know what, this guy, I do feel was screwed over by the elites. So shall I tell you what? I'm really annoying. Imagine if Simon D like became. <laughs> Like, um, like they basically became bigger than like Philip Schofield yeah. or whatever. Like whoever was bigger than two, like bigger than Anton Deck, yeah. right? Like, like, Bill Cotton would have died. He would have. He would yeah. have had the most miserable like retirement imaginable if like, Simon D was big again. Like Ryan Seacrest, like that level. Yeah. That yeah, yeah. popularity. I do think to a certain extent the problem with that is that he interviewed like Brian Sowell, Sewell, who was massive. Hmm. Not massive, but he was big with like sort of like mid level impressionists. Like for instance, if he'd have interviewed like at the time like David Beckham and Posh Bice, he yeah. would have been back, <laughs> right? Like a mil even if he interviewed someone like George Best, who was like so, so a big 1960s person yeah yeah but yeah. no he interviewed like an ob slightly obscure art creek that was never gonna get his show back ever and it was the review of the 2003 d time call written a callback <laughs> um the critic wrote alan partridge a toxic mix of naff bitterness strange vulnerability and pompous self-regard i mean that's pretty that's pretty harsh isn't it but Okay, you're Simon D, but it doesn't mean that you're, you should treat people any differently. Uh, 
uh, but he couldn't see that. I actually looked on and I would fully recommend anybody um, to, to Google Simon D Winchester tribute. Um, which is well, it's a it's kind of a clip from two thousand and nine where Winchester paid yes. tribute to Simon D, and it's got one of the most like mind boggling, but I, I don't know, very kind of sixties gummy tributes I've ever heard to someone who's just died, right? <laughs> and I'm gonna read a quote that I've written down. There was a man, and I don't know who he was, but he knew Simon D. And he kind of, he looked quite official. Because there were, basically, they were pointed on the funeral and they said the obituaries was good and the standard for singing was good. So it's very, very true to his word, you know, if, if he told you something that he felt, you knew that was how he felt. Uh, well, yeah. outside Tom's cafe bar, Tom Romita, and he's an Italian Englishman who runs his celebrated cafe in Winchester, where all the best people meet for coffee. Is he trying to promote and Winchester a Cafe? I guess, in fact, if you were a BBC oh, movie, you would call it the last of the summer wine. Because most of the people who come here are probably over their 50s, and we reminisce about life and about good times and bad times. And the epicenter of these relationships here was Simon himself. So we loved Simon hugely. He told us about his life and his hopes and expectations, and was never dull, and always appreciated the female form more than anybody else I know. Sorry? He never felt any self-pity in his past. He, he was. He, <laughs> I thought he was going to end that, and he, you know, and all his family will live for it. And he loved the female form. Like, that is so dubious, isn't it? Like. <laughs> and he loved the female form. He loved the female form. What Simon would have really wanted more than anything else is for you to visit Winchester Cafe for, for a pork pie that will give you food poisoning. <laughs> And they not like how they somehow also managed to get last of the summer wine in there as well. <laughs> like, it's such a weird, in a way it feels like it sums up. Mate. It feels weird and quite a fitting tribute to him, in a way. How do you think he should be remembered in... Yeah. Well, that's... <laughs> I love the female <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I I feel like he should. I think in some ways he will be remembered, like as a warning, really, of like arrogance and because I feel like if he easily he could have a film written about him, yeah. because it would be then with the moral of like just don't get above your station, but while at the same time. Very like the nuance of it is is that he, although he was in the wrong, he just got destroyed by perhaps the even more arrogant, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. like all for it, like the institution of the BBC, like they just destroyed him. Fact is, he lived like he died in two thousand nine of um, bone cancer. So basically, he lived a good life. It was in a way almost potentially was happier than he would have been had he, like, continued to be successful. He just seemed to be a guy who, who like, everyone saw on TV at a certain point, and then he and then he wasn't, and then he'd come back now and again on chat shows, and they'd go, oh, what happened to you? And he would just say, oh, this stuff happened to me. And then five years later, we had another chat show again explaining, well, yeah. it's been away even longer now. What happened? And that would, that was just basically the rest of his uh, public life. I feel in a way, though, that he's, he's amazing, like, the influence of, like, at the time, he was massive, and but, like, he literally had such a big influence. Like, I feel like he... I don't know whether... It was intended or not, but I feel he was the real prototype for Alan Partridge. He could have been James Bond. He yeah. was in the Italian job, albeit by the sound of it, the worst part of the Italian job. He was um, um, Austin Powers, which is a massively iconic film, was based on him. I can't remember the joke now, but I watched one of his shows and he ended it like 
and maybe this was hilarious in the 60s. I, I'm not actually going to tell this joke correctly, right? <laughs> One of the best voices in pop at the moment, Wayne Fontana, and I wish you'd get another hit. Anyway, thank you very much, Wayne. Lionel Jeffries, Zanny York, and everybody else on the show. Finally, finally, did you hear about the goat who said to his mate, are you kidding? She said, no, just putting on weight. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne.